forgot to mention that I love football and, and I'm a tech and a techno DJ. Yeah. Yeah. So how are we all feeling today? <clears throat> Even though Fiona wants to characterise me as an angry Glaswegian, I'm a happy Glaswegian and a happy Scots person today because Scotland beat Spain 2-0. Yesterday, and I feel even more at home today in Bristol because it's absolutely bucketing with rain uh, down outside. So I hope you're feeling as good as I am today. Um, before I get into the presentation, um, even though we're here in Bristol in the UK, I'd still like to start with an acknowledgement um, of traditional owners of the lands where I do my research in Australia and particularly at QUT. Um, and QUT acknowledges the Turbul and Yugra as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands, these are lands which were taken from them without treaty or compensation, and pay respects to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. And I think it's important that even though we work in you know, institutions as universities, to recognise that lands such as where QUT stands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Um, so we acknowledge at QUT the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play um, within the QUT community. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about this idea of consumption re-territorialised and particularly um, through focusing uh, on gambling because obviously this is a gambling hub, right? This is the Bristol gambling hub, which is a big deal here at Bristol, I know. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this idea of consumption re-territorialised in the context of a recent Australian Research Council um, grant, uh, discovery grant. Um, that I've been working over uh, over the last three years on. Um, as you can see, this kind of probably does reflect what Fiona says, this inter- and transdisciplinary approach um, to our research. So we've got, you know, myself who's a social and critical marketer. We've got Professor Gerda Reith who's at Glasgow, who's a sociologist, um, uh, particularly looking at gambling. Um, Gordon Waite, who's at Wollongong, he's a human geographer. We've got Joseph Cherchiari at Swinburne, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, um, and then Lauren Guerreri, who's a consumer culture researcher at RMIT. So a bit of a chip mix, I would say. A bit of a, you know, interesting combination of disciplines, perspectives, and approaches. But I think one that's worked really well in this project, uh, one that I was, we were all excited about going into the project, but actually you're a bit apprehensive as well because you're thinking, Will this really work in practice? Uh, and actually, I feel like hopefully it has, um, and hopefully I can demonstrate that today as well. So the research context, probably telling grannies to suck eggs here, but I'm sure it's still worth reminding ourselves why we're looking at gambling. What is the gambling research context? Gambling is big business. We know that. The global market is dynamic and growing. It's worth over 700 billion US dollars in 2022 um, and growing about 10, 15 billion dollars uh, per year in market size. So this is big. Um, it's dynamic because things like new technologies, you know, online casinos, fixed odds betting terminals, mobile smartphones and sports betting apps um, have changed how, we ga how people gamble. And as I'll go on to argue, conceptually, they've changed the territories of gambling. They've changed the context, the spaces and places and the situations in which gambling can occur. And indeed, Gerda and I made an argument in a previous paper that what this has done is it's now made it easier to bet anywhere, anytime and indeed on anything. Um, some of the other factors that have played into this re-territorialisation of gambling, um, a liberalised policy and regulatory environment. So there was a wonderful gambling, gamble, um, gambling Act in 2005. Um, I still remember that and thinking, what are they doing? Um, they've learned all of the lessons from alcohol and tobacco here and turned them on ahead. Um, it's similar in Australia. We've got a very lacy fair, um, you know, self-regulatory, light-touch light policy and regulatory environment. And indeed, if you look globally, um, this is further ad advancing. Um, the United States, in which sports betting and most forms of gambling um, were banned, apart from obviously in the state of Nevada, which everyone knows about Vegas. Um, they've even legalized sports betting. So this is, this is happening and it's getting even more and more uh, lacy fair in terms of policy and regulation. Um, scholars have also looked at the gambling industry's efforts to normalize gambling and legitimize it. 
Um, and a lot of work has been done in that space. So Ashley Humphreys has got a great couple of papers in Journal of Marketing and Journal of Consumer Research that talks a lot about that. So the research context is one that's quite interesting, but also quite challenging if you want to mitigate gambling-related uh, harms. Now, in this project, we specifically looked at sports betting, uh, not just because Ross loves sport. Obviously, you can see him wearing the Scotland football jersey. Um, but also because it's the fastest growing segment of the Australian gambling market. So total expenditure in Australia was um, up over 5.5 billion back in 2020 to 2021. And it's again growing um, uh, significantly each year. So you can see market size increasing on average 4.3% per year over the last five years. Um, now, we thought about, th we, we, we kind of, I guess, in our an analyzing all the data, the, t the too much data that we collected in this project, um, what we started thinking about is, this is a really good example, gambling is a really good example of where consumption has become re-territorialized, re where the spaces and places and contexts of consumption have changed. Uh, and you can actually start to see that if you look more broadly beyond gambling um, and, and in terms of how other forms of consumption have become re-territorialized. Um, a good example is dating, right? Dating has very much changed now. A lot of people use online dating apps. It's all about swiping left and right and whatever it is you do, um, rather than you know, meeting people through friends or works or going on a blind date or going out to you know, pubs or clubs or whatever it is. Um, so the context of consumption, if you, want, you know, if you go to the extent that we do in marketing consumer research and frame dating as a consumption practice, um, has certainly changed. Similar with dining, we saw that a lot even during the COVID pandemic. If you think about fine dining, um, what were fancy pants restaurants like some of the ones that you've got here in Bristol, which I took my wife to the other night, um, what, what did they do, right, when they're, you know, all about fine dining when there's a pandemic, people are not allowed to go out. Um, and we saw that, again, consumption became re territorialized there, where fine dining um, occurs in the home um, through home delivery options. It freed up restaurateurs to think about, you know, being experimental, going beyond their pre-existing menus, and indeed the, the field is kind of wide open for um, uh, companies to work in that space, not just existing restaurants. So a lot of startups came up, came about in that time as well. Um, and even if we think about healthcare consumption, um, again, that's become re-territorialized through technologies, through, again, the impacts of the pandemic, through different ways of communicating and engaging um, with people. So a lot of focus on e-health, telehealth, um, you know, mobile health services, you know, it's not all about the traditional um, territories of, of healthcare consumption where you go to a doctor's surgery or you go to a hospital. So we were interested in this when we were analysing our gambling data and thinking, OK, there's something going on here that's not that well understood in our literature, marketing consumer research, about consumption becoming re-territorialised. And what does that do? Okay? What effects does that have? What impacts does that have? Uh, and what do we take away from that? So we kind of have framed uh, our findings or some of our findings from this project through this idea of consumption ter territories and what happens when they become re-territorialized. So we conceive consumption territories as a coming together of forms of content and forms of expression. Um, this is heavily borrowing on the ideas of Deleuze and Guattari. Um, who write a lot about, I guess, social material arrangements or assemblages. Um, so when we talk about forms of content, we're talking like things like spaces, places, bodies, and materials. And when we talk about forms of expression, um, that relates to you know, social relations, ideas, emotions, affects, and so on. So we're interested in consumption territories as being these contexts in which these various elements come together. Um, but they come together in such ways to produce a particular working order, okay? They do something. It's not just about describing what the consumption territory is. It's looking at what does it do and what, what implications does that have? And that's, uh, again, what attracts us to the ideas of Deleuze and Guattari, and I, I tend to use their um, ideas quite a lot in my own research, um, is that they are very much interested in what, what does it do, what outcomes does it produce? 
uh, and then how might we think about that in terms of change. Um, so being a behavioural and social change researcher, Deleuze and Guattari are actually about change. They were actually, you know, a bit of their history, they were frustrated Marxists who saw the collapse of the 1968 revolution and thought, okay, we need to theorise and better understand the world and capitalism if we want to change and break beyond it. Um, so they were actually very much oriented towards social change. So when we think about this idea of consumption territories, these can be different. They can be static, they can be experiential, they can be branded, they can be public, they can be digital, they can be mobile, and they can be multiplicitous. So again, this kind of diversity and multiplicity lends itself well to the ideas of, of um, Deleuze and Guattari. And thinking through a Deleuze and Guattari perspective, consumers territorialise, they enter and participate in consumption territories because they need to, um, and they need to territorialise because we are all never far away from chaos in the social world. So by participating as a gambler in gambling territories, it's almost a way to kind of organise your life and try and make sense of it and try and have a bit of a safe space or an enjoyable space or a fun space that keeps you okay and managing to get through um, in, the fa in, the, you know, in the face of all the chaos and challenges and, and dramas that is everyday life. And as Ian Buchanan, who also works at the University of Wollongong, says, the territory transforms not only the elements constituting it, but its inhabitants as well. And I think that's a really important point for our research, okay? This is not just about looking at how the gambling consumption territory has changed and what the elements of that are. It's Ian's encouraging us to answer, ask what's happening to the consumers in the territory. And that's what we want to look at here. So we argue that consumption territories offer a useful way to think about what happens to consumers when the context of consumption changes. So for example, what happens when form, scale or intensity of consumption um, might shift? So a way that we can think about this from Deleuze Guattari and um, uh, philosophy is through deterritorialization and re-territorialization. So following Deleuze and de Guattari, they argue that changes to the context of consumption can be un understood through these ongoing processes. So deterritorialization tends to happen when consumption becomes disrupted, it's, it's uh, altered, it's abstracted. And that can happen to any one of a given component in the territory or all the different components of the territory. So it's a coming apart or a drifting from the habitual. So we think about gambling again. You know, gambling used to be, you know, you go to a casino or it's the old man in the betting shop putting on a line on the horses. You know, that's what I grew up amongst in Glasgow and it certainly was a, is a case in Australia. Um, but that's, that's come apart. That idea of what a gambling consumption territory is has massively changed over the last 20, 20 years. So that's a, a deterritorialization of what that used to be, and it's re-territorialized as something else. It's, it's shape-shifted to become something else. And that's important because the losing Atari recognized that through their idea of re-territorialization. It always occurs immediately following a deterritorialization. Okay. It comprises material expressive forces that work to reconstitute and reconfigure, which is, I know, something that Fiona looks a lot at, consumption territories. So it's a return. It's a coming back together of the territory in a new way that produce, produces different or new outcomes. Uh, and that's really what we are arguing has gone on with gambling. And what we want to look at is, OK, well, what are the implications of that? Now, literature in marketing consumer research has tried to look at consumption territories and, you know, given us a few ideas or contributions there, it's argued that, you know, consumers um, can stabilise consumption territories through routine associations, but also territories can become deterritorialized in ways that change the aesthetics and even the regulatory aspects that govern those consumption practices and the consumer culture within it. Robert Kozinets' work has looked at how consumption territories might be altered by technology platforms. And what that does is it reshapes networks, rituals, and even consumer desire uh, in those contexts. He actually um, did a big study about food porn, um, and that's the Spamela Anderson burger, which actually looks really disgusting, doesn't it? Um, to actually look at you know, how digital uh, 
marketing and, and digital platforms have actually reshaped how consumers, you know, experience food and consume food. Now, interestingly, Cosinets um, pointed out there's less focus on what happens to consumers when consumption becomes re-territorialized. So a lot of the work is focused on the, the de-territorializing ter part. Um, and Cosinets pointed this out. He says, look, we need to pay more attention to the implications that may emerge from de- and re-territorialization of consumption, especially those that amplify the ways that may harm consumers and serve corporate and capitalist objectives. Hello, this is really speaking to research on gambling, if you ask me, right? He's pointing to that to say, look, whoa, we can't just describe this and go, wow, look at all this cool ways in which consumption has changed. We need to actually be watchful uh, and, and, and consider what this might be doing that's harmful. So we argue that gambling has become re-territorialized, and we see that new technologies like smartphone betting apps, online casinos, we know, change the spaces and places in which gambling occurs, makes it easier to gamble anywhere, anytime, with anyone or anything. So you know, we've made that argument, gambling has become re-territorialized. It's no longer the purview of casinos or betting shops. It's a practice that can be formed in homes, in workplaces, with friends, on the bus, alone. We haven't had some participants talking about how they gamble when they're on the toilet. Uh, or in secret, you know, maybe they're in the same house as a partner, but they're kind of in another room and secretly betting. But the recency of these changes means the impact on consumers from this re-territorialization are not yet fully understood. I know we're all doing work in these spaces to bring that forward, but, you know, policymakers, regulators, and even... Uh, researchers uh, are not fully understanding this yet. So our research considers this. It considers the impact of this re-territorialization of gambling on things like emotions, on sociality, on relationships, finances, employment, and even mental and physical well-being. So this project is quite big, quite complex, quite challenging because we did it through the COVID pandemic. So, you know, I can connect to a lot of other people that had similar dramas, doing big projects during COVID. But actually, it was quite interesting as well because some stuff happened with gambling and gambling consumption during COVID um, that I think are fascinating. This is a focused study. So this is not um, big sample size. This is collecting a lot of data and working intensively with a smaller group of consumers over a long period of time. So we worked with 51 low and moderate risk gamblers we chose low and moderate risk gamblers because most gambling research focuses on problem and pathological gamblers. However, the burden of harm is far greater from low and moderate risk gamblers, just because of the simple fact there's more of them. So the, the harm that that causes to society is more exponential. So it kind of suggests to me we've been maybe looking in the wrong places, or also we know more and more people are gambling with these forms of technologies. Uh, we did a study in the Sydney metro region. We had a sample bias more towards young men because we know from the statistics that you know, young men are more likely to engage in sports betting. But there is emerging research that more and more young females are engaging in sports betting. So we wanted to capture um, a little bit of that and kind of explore that. Uh, and indeed, I predict where gambling marketers will go in the future is they'll really target female gamblers because that's exactly what they did with alcohol and that's exactly what they did with tobacco. So our aim was to explore how people experience and navigate sports betting practices and then triangulate the insights from our mixed methods multimodal approach to try and better understand mobile smartphone sports betting and potential for risks and harm. So although I'm talking to you today about this idea of the re-territorialization of gambling, our broader aims for the overall project means we'll be looking at other questions and other, other things um, across our analysis. Four stages to the project. Stage one involved narrative interviews, a bit of a getting to know you, um, I guess, phase, get a bit of their back, back story, who they are, you know, their positionality, uh, getting a, a, bit, a bit of their life history of gambling. When did they first start to gamble? When did they first start to engage in sports betting? How did they feel about it? What did they get out of it? And so on. Stage two involved uh, cognitive neuroscience. So what we actually did is we ran an EEG study. Um, we set up a kind of living room style lab 
uh, at the university, we get participants in. Um, they have a mobile smartphone with uh, sports betting apps loaded with uh, funds. And they are actually asked to place bets on a forthcoming sporting fixture, fixture which was National Rugby League. So we, we did our study uh, on the National Rugby League uh, in Australia. Um, it's probably not really popular in Bristol, but it's big in Australia. And also the time zone worked for us because we probably should, could have done it on football, but that's in the middle of the night in Australia, so it's not going to work. Um, so they bet on the, the sporting event, and then we record that in the EG. We also video record that. And then what we do is they watch the game. They watch the game live that they've bet on. We record the EEG from that as well until the outcome is known, right, to the end of the game. So quite a long EEG recording, quite a long video recording, a lot of data, but really fascinating because it's a... I, I mean, I think, to our knowledge, this is one of the most realistic, real-life gambling experiments out there because a lot of gambling experiments tend to be, you know, it's a made-up game, it's not a real sporting event, it's not real money. Uh, it was interesting getting that through ethics, but actually it wasn't that challenging. The bigger challenge was explaining to QUT why Ross's credit card kept on having spenditure on gambling accounts all the time. <laughs> and they kind of were, you know, losing their, losing their shit, thinking Ross is out there <laughs> abusing QUT credit cards. Um, had to gently explain to them, no, this is a legitimate ERC project. Um, so that was really interesting because that allowed for us to capture, you know, attention, emotional engagement, memory processing, cognitive decision making, uh, and so on and so forth, as they bet and then as they watch the game and then see what the outcome of that bet is going to be. Stage three, we then did post EEG follow-up interviews. So we did uh, analysis on the EEG data for each participant. We created a kind of summary of that and we shared that with participants and then talked to them about it. Talked to them about their experience, Talk to them about, well, we noticed, for example, emotion was high or attention was high at certain points um, when they were betting, when they were watching the game, asking them what was going on for them, how did they feel, you know, what were they thinking, you know, what was their experience of it. Um, and I think that was a really neat a way to do that because we got a lot of really deep insights about what was going on and a way of co-creating interpretation uh, of meaning there. And then finally, stage four, we invited our participants to uh, take part in a visual ethnography. For this, we asked them to, over a two-week period, um, shoot videos on their smartphone, take photos of their gambling. You know, who they're with, where they are, what's going on, how they were feeling, what they were thinking, um, all of that stuff. They then submitted that visual material. We had a look at it you know, did some kind of initial analysis and then invited them in for an interview to talk through it again. So similar to the EEG where we do that follow-up interview uh, and kind of like try to interpret um, the visual data. Um, I think this used the skill set of our team really well. It really brought, you know, t us together to collaborate and, and kind of bring our different disciplinary expertise in a neat way. It created mountains of data, so we've got a lot of data uh, and you know how it always goes, right? You think, how many, how many papers can I stand getting out of this data set before I want to shoot myself? We are not there yet. We've only really started getting into that. And I, I, think, I think I'll give it five years because this was a big project. But after that, I think, you know, probably give up. Okay, so, um, and there's a, there's a photograph of the, the experiment. So we actually see we've got the sports betting app. Uh, we've got the big screen TV. They were logged in to watch Fox Sports on my account so they could watch the, the game. So, yeah, the idea was to set it up as if they're really watching it. Um, and probably the biggest indication for me that actually this was quite realistic, because, you know, we'll get questions about that for, uh, from methodologists, is when we were watching the games... Uh, with participants, like when stuff was happening in the match, they're just like, oh, give it to that player and I need this try so that I can win the bet. And they were just so into it and so engaged, you could tell they forgot they were wearing an EEG cap or that they were in an experiment. They were actually really into the game. Um, so I think that was really cool to see. Okay, so the findings. Um, wanted to just give some examples of this re-territorialization of gambling and how that is 
technologically and market mediated. And when I talk about that, I mean things like smartphones, apps, and gambling marketing that are driving this. Um, this kind of this kind of screenshot from one of the sports betting apps uh, in Australia is very common. And you see what the gambling companies do here. They're not just offering you odds on a betting opportunity, right? They're embedding what they are doing as part of the game, as part of the knowledge about the game, as part of the discourse, the everyday consumption and cultural practice um, of the game. And here you see, look, they talk about tips and match insights. Melbourne has won each of its 17 previous matches against South Sydney and Melbourne. I actually support South Sydney Rabbit O's, so that's kind of rubbish, but uh, in Melbourne are a bit of the evil empire. And then Ryan Pappenhausen has scored at least one try in each of his last four appearances at Amy Park. They do that a lot. They do that in their market, and they do it in the apps. They even have people that come on in a sportscast of the, sh the, the game to talk about this, as if, hey, we are just here chatting about the game, and we are part of the game and part of the culture of it, um, and the kind of gambling just happens to be there. Okay, so they do that quite smartly. And then one of our participants, Lucas, he talks about this technology and market mediation as well. He talks about he put a limit on himself for the month of $500 for betting, but he pretty much went over that limit within two weeks. So he had two weeks to go, and then the gambling company sent him a text message saying, if you deposit another $250, we will give you a $250 bonus bet. Right, so he's already went up beyond his budget. Immediately we can see there's harm being created here. And the gambling industry are going, yeah, you know what? We can see you've spent that money. Here's a little, little inducement to go and spend some more. And he says, look, whenever they used to do that, I'd always do it and I'd put it on. Then I'd put 250 on one, 250 on the other. Some weeks I'd spend when I was really bad. And he even admits he'd spend half his paycheck before he'd even left work. Right? And then he's considering, how am I going to tell the wife? I put it off you know, to avoid a confrontation. But it's bad when you lose a lot, you start to lie. You kind of hide in things. The truth might you know, get left out. You know, and Lucas, is a, you know, he's got a partner. He's got two children. Right? So it's not just his wife that he's lying to and he's losing this money for himself. But he's got kids. He's got responsibilities, right? So there's, there's clear harm going on here. This re-territorialization of gambling is creating harm. Um, we can see that with uh, you know, the, the, the bombardment that people get with gambling marketing now. Um, lots of stuff out there. Uh, you know, you've got think, you know, different techniques like venue mode. Um, you've got a lot of use of uh, cultural appeals and marketing appeals like humor. This is kind of sick one. Paddy Power are quite notorious for this. So this was years ago. Remember the Oscar Pretorius trial? And it says, money back if he walks. Or, you know, ha, 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 you know, he's got no legs and all of that, right? Um, and they're actually offering bets on the outcome of the trial, right? So they're not even just offering bets on sport. They're kind of making a sport out of betting on other stuff as well. Sports bet as well, they created a Trump hub during the US election. And it was all these different crazy bets on the latest batshit crazy thing that Donald Trump would do, which does a lot. And you can see they even create a little cartoonized, stylized uh, image of Trump and everything. Um, and even the, US, uh, the Australian election. So this was a tweet from the federal election in Australia last year. Uh, and it's actually an advert for, for tab and betting, right? It's saying, look, this bloke's making Rose Hill his first preference, Ozpol. And the reason why... Um, there's that little sausage there. It's what we have in Australia, when you go to vote, you have this idea called democracy sausage. So every voting polling station has like a, they have like a barbecue, and it's like, you know, it's a ritual. You go and vote, then you go and get your democracy sausage, and you go, yeah, it's great to be Australian. But, you know, so they're really, they're really tapping into the cultural zeitgeist here um, in their marketing. They're very, very clever. Um, and then we also see that in um, you know, a lot of their advertising. This is a Ladbrokes ad. So there's this guy, right? The Believer. He likes his odds long and his wins big. Risk would be his middle name if it wasn't already Douglas. And Generous John, first to the bar, last in the cab. He knows betting's a team sport. And who better to have on your team than Brightside here? If he was a battery, he'd be positive at both ends. 
And then there's the professor, calculator with a beard. He knows all the stats and facts and reckons he can work the whole thing out. Which winds this man up no end. Where's the fun in form, he says. When you know, you know you know. You know? They are the dreamers, the glory seekers, the back page philosophers, the Wednesday night warriors. They are the have a go heroes of Saturday afternoon. They are the betting men. And this is the Ladbrooks Live. So what this is, this is lifestyle. This is putting gambling at the centre of people's lifestyle as an everyday practice, right? This is not just a discreet you know, product they're marketing. It's let's put this at the centre of what people are doing as consumers. Um, this is another example. This is a little bit more on the edgy side. This is a uh, sports bet again in Australia. They're notorious for really pushing the boundaries in their advertising, and they often get a lot of complaints. So I'm going to run this one. You can maybe discern what I'm getting at there. Sportsbet's new iPhone app is so easy, even the permanently offended can claim a winner-winner chicken to... Oh, sorry, vegan-based dinner. It's so easy. It's outrageous! <laughs> Typical. Carol here thinks she's about to inherit a Nigerian fortune, but finding some value across sport and racing... Seems too good to be true. Yeah, that's gold, Carol. Even whiz kid Todd Carney can use it. Yeah, piece of... The new iPhone app from Sportsbet. It's foolproof. So there you've got, you know, it's, it's sexist, it's racist, it's misogynistic, it's all of these things. But they're doing that because they think their target demographic loves this kind of chat, right? It's irreverent, it's naughty, it's edgy, and they really do that to appeal to young men who are gamblers. Um, they actually got heavily carpeted for that, especially because of that middle segment, because you're basically suggesting all Ni Nigerian people are scammers, which is highly racist. Um, the last part, that was a former NRL player. So again, they're using sports stars. He had a bit of a scandal because he got caught in public doing a bubbler, which I don't know if I really want to describe it, but it means doing something with your pee uh, in a quite disgusting way. Um, so, you know, they're tapping again into these cultural references. I'll tell you, I'll tell you at the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're tapping into these cultural references, but also, you know, they're happy to be a little bit, you know, a little bit controversial. Um, here we've got Jessica, who's a, a female um, gambler. She's divorced with three children. She talks about the good thing about sports bet, they show your potential winnings, right? So if you've got three children, you're divorced, you're not on much money, right? And money's a concern. She's saying the betting app is actually trying to help me here. Or are they really helping by showing you, hey, look what you could win. You could have all this money in your account. That's quite attractive to someone who's, you know, uh, living on paycheck to paycheck. Um, so she's saying they do a rough cart thing and show up what your layout and potential winnings will be, and I really like that. Um, so I don't really need to check the app again because at the start it'll tell me when I place the bets what the winnings will be. Um, this was a participant who actually admitted that when it came to the grand final, which South Sydney Rabbit was played in, she did a household budget and couldn't afford to bet on that game. Um, but then she s sent in all her video footage, kind of like, you know, weighing this up over the day of the grand final and really struggling with it. And you know what? Guess what happens? In the end, she gives up and she puts some money on the game. Uh, and unfortunately, South Sydney lost that game. So, you know, this is kind of, this re-territorialization is forcing people into these situations, again, as I say, that are creating harm. And what it's doing is it's, it's intensifying and growing the, uh, the different forms and the scale uh, of gambling through this re-territorialization. And I think this is really well exemplified by Eddie. He's actually a bit better off, but he's talking about um, uh, his experiences with gambling uh, and sports betting at work. Okay, it is Wednesday morning. Um, got a pretty quiet day today, so there's NBA on, which it's a quiet time of year for me betting-wise. NFL season's finished. Um, rugby league season's still not started up, so during the working day, I like to bet on the NBA at times. Um, it just gets me through the day. Nothing too big, um, and it really means that I can be at work and still follow scores in the background. Um, what am I thinking about? I, I'm, I'm really only thinking 
you know, bet small to win big. It's not one of those days where I'm going to be watching the, the, the games intently. I'm really going to be not focused on what's going on. It's just going to be in the background. But, you know, I've got this idea in my head that, you know, if I could bet small, tuck it away and forget about it, then, you know, I might get a good result in terms of a win. So um, the NBA is great because it's on right bang in the middle of the workday. So any time between... Um, you know, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, I feel I always like doing this because it means that I don't have to bet a lot. I'm not getting stressed watching the games. Um, I'm betting at home now before I have my first meeting at 9 because, as I said, it's not something that I'll do a lot of research on. I mean, I'll look at the games. I'll look at their past results. Um, I'll look at their schedule to see whether they played recently. And yeah, again, the feeling is just one of, of excitement. Um, it's one of, you know, I expect to win, even though I hardly ever do on these ones because the odds are so big. Um, but it just, again, it just gives me something to, to excite me throughout the da- a, a, a very stale work day. So again, this re-territorialization, betting now happens at work, and it's a way to get through the dull work day. He's an investment banker, and you know I'm sure his corporate masters won't be too happy that he's spending most of the day in the NBA. And you can see how he downplays stuff as well. He talks about, I don't really spend much time and effort on it, and then he says, I check all these things. Right, And he's obviously spending a lot of time and energy and effort on this. And in another quote, Eddie actually admits, look, he gambles anywhere and everywhere. He's at the shops, he's walking, he's at dinner, his partner goes to the toilet, he gets the app out and he's on on the betting app. Um, You know, so he's on this a lot. He's using this a lot. This re-territorialization has changed um, his everyday practices. Um, We can see other examples of these changes in the form and scale Jacob talks about betting on the way home from work on the train. Uh, Felicity, who's a female Chinese-Australian participant, talks about you know, betting after work on a, on a weekend, usually during the nights when she's got some free time. So you know, this after-work decomposing leisure time has become betting time. Um, or even Frank, who's a, a male Maltese-Australian, talks about um, using Maltese. Um, so these multi-bets, these are like accumulator bets, where, you know, exponentially the odds uh, will get longer, but the wins will get bigger. Uh, it talks about on a Saturday, he won three multis, and that's why last week was pretty big. Um, he starts looking at multis now for the next weekend and, and thinking about, um, you know, what to put that, that, those on, what the different sports are available for that. Um, so again, you know, really big changes to how gambling consumption is going on. Um, Graham here talks about going to sports bars and sports clubs, uh, cutting betting with mates on horses. Um, you know, they got to football with a group of people. Some of them don't even play pokies or in the sports bar. Um, and the, the, he's admitting that actually the socialization has become about this, okay? Um, we've actually got to stop being social with the people that were there. So we think about it as our punt has shaped our social interaction with some of our friends as well. Okay, again, this re-territorialization, sports betting now is in these social dynamics, in these social groups, in these social spaces, and changing things around. Uh, And then this is where I mentioned COVID came in, interestingly. Graham, as a male Anglo-Australian, talked about during the lockdown. He's got a couple of mates from Sydney, a mate from Canberra. They're all in lockdown at the same time. So they put a bet with mates thing together. um, And they all put 100 bucks in. It got to nearly 700. Um, and he says, look, I think sports bet did this because they saw a huge market they weren't tapping into. This competition between mates, this group, you know, dynamic. Um, rather, betting doesn't need to be an individual consumption pursuit, right? Actually, this is a group thing as well. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that. A lot of the other gambling companies are now offering similar features like bet with mates did uh, uh, through sports bet. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of changes to form and scale through this re-territorialization is there's also changes in intensity of gambling. Um, and I think that's also very relevant to harm. Um, Zach, who's a 32-year-old male uh, from a Vietnamese background, says, you know, I feel more concentrated. I've made the bet. I've got to follow my team. So I'm more sealed into the game. It, it, it kind of, the association between sports and betting 
puts you almost in this flow state, this real hyper state of you know, anxiety, of focus, of concentration. Faye says that as well, as a 32-year-old female from a Sri Lankan background. I'm zoned in in the game in regards to the scoreline, the players, how they're moving, and obviously the time is on the clock. Okay, so this is getting people really uh, intensely focused on what they're doing. Of course, gambling companies want you to do that. They want you to be locked in. You were already addicted to smartphones. People are really into sport, and then you bring gambling into that mix as well. Wow, this is a really powerful combination. Uh, Solomon says something similar. You don't want to be interrupted. You're in the comfort zone. You're in the game. You want to know what the end result is. Um, okay, so this is, again, intensifying consumer experiences and even practices um, of sports betting. Uh, and we actually saw this when we um, do the EEG as well. And you see um, from this, oh, let me get it all up. Yeah, from this diagram here, um, this is uh, mapping the whole process of checking and selecting information on the app uh, and then actually making the bet. And you can see here these peaks are in theta, which indicates emotional engagement, right? So you can see here the real peak when they first check the odds and then probably when they figure out the odds and see what might be available to win on a bet they're interested in. And then again, there's an emotional intensity uh, when they make the bet. Okay? And look, that's no surprise. We know that sports betting is emotionally appealing and emotionally engaging, but the EEG evidence uh, backs that up. Um, we can see watching the game, betting versus non-betting, again, emotionally and cognitively engaged, making associations uh, and visually engaged from our uh, Loretta analysis, looking at which part of the brains uh, are, are kind of engaged at certain points in the experiment. Uh, and we also see this beyond actual placing the bet to watching the game and you know, seeing what the outcome is likely to be. And you've got key, uh, you know, key events in that process you know, when a try is scored or when a, a penalty goal is scored, when there's something happening on a scoreboard that helps you make sense of what's going to happen in terms of the outcome of the game. So again, you know, when you watch the game and a penalty is scored, making a st associations, establishing visual associations, okay, what does that mean for my bet? Watching the game when there's a try scored, which is, a, you know, a, a lot of points uh, on offer there. Decision-making, processing rewards, planning, maybe even what you're going to do with your winnings. Um, and then if there's a win, uh, emotion and strategic decision making, okay, yes, I've won the bet, okay, now I'm going to think about, you know, what that means, what I might do with the money, or even how might that, might that influence future betting practices. Um, so these emotional intensities are a form of intensity that have come about through this re-territorialization that we're also interested in, and I think the, the EEG analysis can really help us speak to those, as well as what people said verbally or in the visual ethnography. So this leads us to question, you know, the implications of this re-territorialization on risk and harm. Um, and we see a couple of examples here. Sylvie talks about a feeling that comes over you when you lose it. You lose, uh, it's, uh, it's horrible, it's a sense of unease. Um, I hate talking about it, it makes me so upset. It drives you crazy. I've dropped my phone, I've smashed the screen. Um, you know, you're crazy. I've lost a bit of money, I was out of my mind. It's horrible, okay? So, you know, this is having really serious implications for people's lives, and it's, it's really damaging them emotionally, financially, mentally, relationship-wise. Um, Jamie talks about having a fight or an argument with his partner. She says, I hate you gambling. It's caused a lot of fights. Uh, I want to keep her happy, but also myself happy, because he gets something out of gambling. Of course he does. He gets a lot out of it. Uh, and he admits, now with the baby coming up, there's a lot more responsibilities and he really is struggling with this. And indeed, that participant struggled a lot, talking a lot about uh, relationship problems through that project because it was really a, a bone of contention uh, in his life. Uh, and then I mentioned Jessica, the, the rabbit was fan, a bit earlier. Uh, she talks about uh, sports bet. So I'm going to just play this quickly and she talks about this weighing up the, the money side of it. So it's still Sunday night, it's almost 20 past 7, um, the kickoff is about to start. Um, just really enjoyed watching the pre-entertainment um, and just getting organised um, to watch the game, which is going to kick off next. Um, I've just decided earlier, five minutes ago, to put on a small bet. Like I said in my last video, I can't really 
afford to bet a hell of a lot this week with all the bills I've got going on, but um, I did want to kind of give in to the temptation and put down a small bet in the hope of winning some money back, but more just for the excitement of knowing that person's going to score the first school trial. So you know, she admits she's done the household budget. She admitted in her earlier video she can't afford to bet. She's not going to do it, but she's given into that temptation. You know, she's even worried about how she's going to pay all the household bills. She's divorced. She's got three kid, uh, kids. But that's still this re-territorialisation has created these contexts in which uh, consumers like Jessica are ending up, you know, kind of taking these risks, and it's you know arguably having this kind of harm, uh, certainly on their finances. So. The implications of this, I think, hopefully have demonstrated that, and you would agree that gambling has, consumption has become re-territorialised. Spaces and places of gambling have opened up. Uh, and through smartphones, sports betting apps, uh, and so on, our participants can create gambling territories anywhere, anytime, uh, and betting on anything at work, at home, in the pub, on the train, at the shops, or even with friends. The sports betting apps and the marketing are a big contributing part to this. They've re-territorialised gambling, but also they are inducing and, and kind of pushing gamblers to engage in particular practices. The apps are slick, they're well-designed, user-friendly, and they present gamblers with various bets, multis, bet with mates, venue mode, free bets, team and player information. It keeps people engaged, it keeps them in the zone with gambling practices. Clever marketing in the apps, TV, social media, in venues, and even sports sponsorship reinforces gambling practices. It normalizes it, embeds it in everyday life, uh, and keeps it right uh, front and center. Um, so what this does, these smartphones, the apps, the betting, and sport, they work together uh, to, work, to create a potential nexus, a, 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 pot sorry, a potent nexus of practices, a nexus where there's interest, engagement, emotion, excitement, escape, passion, and thrills. Because everyday life is bloody hard, right? Especially under this latest form of wonderful capitalism, right? And, you know, th these problems are not going away. and get They're getting worse. Um, and people are th we're looking for an out. They're looking for an escape. They're looking for something else and something different. So gambling consumption territories can offer that. But for some, there are clear risks and harms as they navigate this nexus of sports betting practices. Placing bigger bets, chasing losses, spending more than budgeted, spending the household money they can't afford, relationship problems. This gambling consumption that's become re-territorialized and through social, technological and market mediation um, has, is, is leading to these implications for risk and harm. So our research here considers some of the harmful implications when consumption becomes re-territorialized, and I hope that marketing consumer researchers in our discipline you know, continue that conversation, because we've never been that great at asking these more critical questions. But certainly in the context of the gamb uh, gambling uh, arena, we can see how that re-territorialization has led to changes in form, scale, and intensity of consumption. So we need to consider our policy settings, you know, even how does mobile smartphone sports betting get regulated? Do we need more robust blocks and restrictions on app use, spending limits, even bank facilitated blocks? I worked on another project with Suncorp Bank in Australia where we actually did primary research with gamblers, family members and stakeholders and then that, that then informed their launch of a gambling block on their uh, 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 banking app. Uh, digital nudges to people at risk of gambling that they've worked out through um, algorithms of their data. And we developed a toolkit of recommendations that has now been adopted by the Australian Banking Association. So certainly banks are active in this space now in Australia and seeing that they are part of the solution as well because they're the ones that have got the data can see when people are betting and, bet and losing a lot on betting. Do we need to restrict marketing promotions that can induce more risky sports betting, especially in apps? You know, we heard from that participant who lost his $500 and then got that push notification to um, put another 250 in and he would get a free 250. My own personal reflection, like I did a lot of work on alcohol marketing in the past. That was what my PhD was about. We've not learned any of the lessons from there, but we can still do that. In France, they have this uh, law called the Loi Van. It governs alcohol and tobacco marketing. It's really neat. What it does is it says, these are the things you're allowed to do in marketing, and everything else is banned. 
What we do in Australia and what we do in the UK in gambling marketing is we go, let's list all the things you can't do and then they invent more new things that you to do and then we try and catch up and then they invent more things and we try and catch up. Oh, and by the way, it's voluntary and self-regulated and you get a tiny slap on the wrist if you breach the rules. Other ideas, perhaps the WHO, who's now starting to look and set up a committee on gambling, might uh, develop best buys on gambling policy, which they've done on alcohol and other areas, or even a framework convention on gambling control policy. Um, and also social marketing programs, I think, have got a role to play here, challenging social norms about gambling, offering tips to avoid risks and harms, and accessing support ser services. Certainly, Australia, support services are rubbish. We get, they're underfunded, they're stretched, um, they're not really fit for purpose. Um, consumers who have accessed and used them have terrible experiences with them. So yes, we can say there's counselling, financial literacy and legal advice out there, but are these services really fit for purpose and are they really doing the job that we need them to do? I would say not, and we've got a lot more work to do there. Uh, and then more broadly, certainly in my own discipline area, I think as marketers and consumer researchers, we need to consider the implications of this re-territorialization idea in other contexts of consumption in which that has happened. Questions? They probably forgot the teaching as well. I don't do any yeah. Oh! <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> Yeah. Look, we do have that data because we're screen recorded. So we, we did screen capture video and EEG. So we actually, you know, you can set up on a smartphone and it records, you know, how they use the app, what they bet on and all of that. We do ha have all that data. Um, I think at some point we we'll probably will interrogate that. And indeed, when I got to Glasgow to work with Gerda, she's particularly interested in that sort of stuff. We haven't looked at it yet because we've only really started pushing papers out. We do have one paper that's just about to appear in marketing theory, which is only based on the stage one interviews. We're working on a paper around this idea of re-territorialization, but it's for the Journal of Consumer Research, which is impossible to get published in. So it's a slow burner. Um, but certainly, yes, it's strange with ARC grants. You don't need to write a final report, which might be a good thing, but also might not be a good thing because you then need to you know, you need to kind of like be pretty good at getting your papers out and getting them written. We are working on that and they will, these things will start coming out. So that's a good, you know, that's a good idea to look at particularly what, what and how did they bet um, and, you know, then look at, well, how does that relate to what we found um, with the EEG or even the other data we collected from that participant. So we are particularly interested in telling like holistic lived experiences stories about let's take this participant's whole gambling journey and, and look at that and look at what was going on in that. And we've got that opportunity because, you know, we've got a smaller data set, but we went deep with each of these 51 people. Yeah. Yeah, um, Barbara? Prophecy Future, it seems that you take two participants in 10 years. No, no, no. That was, that's our research team. So that was just, oh, okay. yeah. So no, each, each, each um, EEG, it's the participant comes in, they bet on the phone, and then they watch the game. So we bring them in, you know, according to the schedule of the matches. They come in, you know, half an hour before the game, place, get the EEG, caps it up. We do a bit of pre-screening as well. There's a couple of, like, questionnaires that they sit, fill in that the cognitive neuroscientists like to use. Even we, we think we um, use a flow and affect scale as well. Um, and then they, they place the bet, we record that, and then they watch the game. Yeah, so it's only one participant at a time. Plus, I've only got one Foxtel account, so I can't run it on more than one screen. <laughs> Although I know there's ways to do that, allegedly. <laughs> yeah? So I'm also thinking, because it sounds like some of the practices that you and Patrick have worked through, which is harm control. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, what kind of support or what was in place for them? Or were they psychotic anyway? Or what yeah. So that's a good question. You're probably thinking he said they recruited low and moderate risk gamblers. What's going on? Um, so what we found, the, the idea of gambling screening is just a, a bit of a joke, really, right? So you do this, fill in this little survey, which is, you know, you, you, you do it yourself. It's self, you know, it's, you respond to it yourself, right? So are you really telling the truth? But it's cross-sectional, right? So we kind of go, well, they're a problem gambler because at one point in time, they did a gambling screen questionnaire and we categorized them as such. But people's lives change, right? Their behaviors fluctuate, their practices fluctuate. So actually, you can't just do a gambling screen at one point in time. Uh, and we picked that up quite early in our project, even though we'd recruited low and moderate risk gamblers, some of our gamblers were moving in and out of different levels of risk. So we, we screened them at each stage and we actually found some had moved and that was okay with our ethics committee because they said, well, look, you did tell us you were recruiting at this point in time at the start, you know, low and moderate risk gamblers, but we recognize over time things change. Um, in terms of support, again, that is a major ethical consideration when doing gambling research. So um, all of our research team, you know, carefully trained and knowledgeable about that, about identifying potential risks and harms, flagging that talking about that with the team, raising that with the ethics committee, and also um, making sure we've always got plenty of information on support services, even though I said they're not that great, but we would take leaflets or make sure all the pro uh, project materials, like information sheet consent form, have got the numbers, they've got the websites. You know, we check in with them again at the end of each stage. You know, how are you feeling? Do you need, you know, do you want access to any support services? Stuff like that. So look, that's not perfect, right? We're not going to be able to fix these people's lives when we see there's you know, bad stuff going on, but we do what we can to make sure that there's you know, some level of support we can direct them to. But from our other research that we did with the bank, we did recognize that there's a real problem in service provision and delivery and the, the quality and capacity is just not there. And also that kind of psychological gambling counseling it's quite normative, and we found particularly problems when you're dealing with pe people from different ethnic backgrounds or you know, cultural backgrounds, or even it's, it's very gendered, so there's a real need to kind of decolonize and introduce intersectional perspectives into gambling support services. That's a whole other conversation, but we've started talking about um, those issues and other, um, other uh, things that we're writing up at the moment. Yeah, we've got one at back then. Uh, yeah, just, I think your hand up was first, so. Okay, yeah. sure. yes, sir. I'm just very curious to find out more about the task force that was in place here. We're looking, I think, at the number of uh, citations task force that are out on um, There is and there isn't. So actually, we did a wee live experiment. So I went on, I went on a trip to Singapore, and I took. We were actually doing an app walkthrough. That's another part of the project. We did researcher-led app walkthroughs, and then we scoped the whole background of these apps and even the gambling companies that own them. And I'll tell you something about that in a minute. Um, and I actually download. So that so when you leave Australia, for example, you go. I went from Australia to Singapore, right? and I try and use the Sportsbet app, it doesn't work because it's territory restricted. You can only use it in Australia, right? However, you can download VPN apps to try and bypass that, uh, but I couldn't get them to work, probably because I'm a Luddite, but... Um, so there are ways around it, right? But, and the thing about that is, right, governments, as we saw with the COVID pandemic,